quick it got it what i think i'll do is just do a quick roll call and um then we'll go into the the, the the full that's full screen mode and share my desktop and we'll get started so um what i've got now is sasha burrows with the consortia george amandola Cyberdynamics, Brian Chong, City of Moore Park, Monica Gibbs, AT&T, Noel Heredia, Digital Value Creation, Nikki Mays with the City of Santa Paula, Steve Sawyer with Charter Communications, myself, Terry Theobald with the County of Ventura, Jamie Fleming in the Ojai Community, Ojai Chamber, Greg Hayward, Trackable Health, Paul Shune with the City of Cuyama, and Kevin Pisasic, the City of Oxnard. Did I get everybody? Yes. All right, thank you for that. And let me go into the screen sharing mode. And uh, we'll do some chatting. Um, I'd like to, if we could, try to keep this to about an hour, hour and 15 minutes at the most uh, meeting this morning. What I would like to be able to do is um, share with you some of the things that are going on. Uh, we can talk about dif different initiatives. Um, gonna spend a lot of time just talking about the process and what's been happening up in the County of Santa Barbara. Um, we wanna talk about the transformation that we were going through as a consortia. And then I'm gonna shut up and I, I'd like to hear everything that you guys have to say because it, it, it's like we've been doing this for six, seven years now and the moment has arrived and it's pretty doggone humbling. Um, I think that it's, it's, there's a saying about uh, building a plane when it's been flying, you know, and, and, and that's exactly what it feels like is we've been flying for a while, but we're completely changing uh, the kind of plane that we're flying while we're in flight. And um, so I, I, I really respect the fact that it's a long way down to the ground. And so, um, so well, this is just a, a high level agenda. We've gone through the introductions. I think everybody knows what a consortia is. Uh, I mentioned the fact that there's an awful lot of funding out there. Um, I know that Terry, you'll be attending the digital divide meeting later today on my, I won't be there, I'm sorry, but I appreciate you running point on that for the region. Um, and, and that's just a group that's trying to bring an awful lot of funds, billions, if you will, to the Southland. Um, but meanwhile, all of these other funds are going through the normal channels and, and they're, uh, it, it's, it's, the rulemaking is happening up in Sacramento. And, and so how that, those funds will arrive, uh, what kinds of quantities, what kinds of hoops you have to jump through to get them, that's all being discussed and talked about. Uh, there was a meeting this last week with uh, the state folks, multiple agencies, and, and there's an awful lot of talk. And, and I, I still don't know where, you, where to start to be the first one in line, how to do that. <laughs> and, and so uh, we're, we're still working that aggressively just to figure out where the line starts and how to be part of it. Um, so with that, I'm going to keep going and we'll come back, I'm sure, talking about that. We have a general uh, approach based on where we've been, what we've been doing. We want to be very inclusive. The AITR in the lower right corner, that means all in the room, that when it comes to a community, we want to make sure that everybody uh, is there and, and part of the solutions. So as a consortium, we're working very hard to do convenings, to then talk about the middle mile infrastructure. Uh, the County of Ventura has invested in this, and we've got a tremendous best practice, if you will, uh, of what, a, what it looks like when you do convene all the stakeholders and you do come up with a stakeholder-driven solution. Um, we're looking at how the middle mile can drive the last mile. And, and so, you know, this is uh, obviously the, the local situation, but when you start talking to municipalities in the local situation, you get to the fact that you can now get into city blocks, into neighborhoods, have all in the room, look at the fiber, map the fiber, which brings us to what's happening in Santa Barbara County. And, and so what, that, what happened on uh, Tuesday this week 
was the Board of Supervisors in Santa Barbara put $200,000 of ARPA funding to the consortium to do what we've been talking about doing, starting to convene meetings, uh, have this discussion about the middle mile, uh, start working in municipalities to have this discussion about the last mile. I was on with the city managers of Solvang and Bulton yesterday. Uh, and then as we do that, to, to also within these communities, um, talk about digital inclusion. And uh, this morning, after, right after this meeting, I'll be meeting with the board of directors of SPCAG, that's, the, that's Santa Barbara's equivalent of ECTC. They're, work, they're moving forward to bring all of the communities, all the cities within Santa Barbara County to the table to do this together. And, and what we're looking for is a regional product a regional product for the middle mile patterned after what Ventura County is doing, followed by participation of all the cities in last mile discussions, as well as the digital inclusion processes. So starting with a, we'll be starting with a, a survey of sorts, just to be able to get anecdotal data, as well as uh, validating data in terms of some of the things we're hearing in the convenings, get into creating the kinds of maps that was on the previous slide, uh, in, in a similar fashion, in a similar manner to understand. And, and we want to see solutions from municipalities occurring at the same time as the regional discussion is occurring, the design that future state. But when it's all said and done, it's not something the consortium is doing. And, and I was explaining this to the city managers yesterday. Our, it's, it's, it's the applications you make to Sacramento in the rulemaking that's taking place. It, it's going to be the network that you design for your community as a, as a anchor to link anchor institutions. It's going to be the grid that you design for fiber within your communities to be able to serve the last mile. It is the policies and procedures you put into place and the standards you agree on as a region together to, to do all of this. It's going to be yours. All we're doing is doing what we've been doing and that's connecting dots, people, the organizations to each other. And, 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 but the, what, what we leave behind in terms of coming up with a strategy is gonna be something that each municipality will own, it'll be theirs, and the county will be connected. And, and so this is the, the very different than anything we've been doing as a consortium. It, it's, it's, it's really uh, quite different and it, it, it's just really something. It, 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 I, I think we've been talking about it a lot. We've been designing it a lot. We've had a lot of discussions amongst ourselves about this kind of stuff, but mountains have been moved and it's fallen in our lap and uh, it's humbling. So with that, I'll uh, keep my mouth shut. And Terry, you probably would like to talk about your week gone by and, and the, the thoughts that you have and uh, positive and negative uh, opportunities and frustrations. Sure, that would be great. Well, first of all, um, my week is all about Halloween. You can't <laughs> tell, but I'm wearing the top half of my steampunk outfit. I was gonna put on the vest and the hat and you know really shake things up, but I, I will show you that I have uh, my own resident um, singer there and uh he's one of about 30 props we have in this building right now for halloween we take halloween very seriously almost as seriously as we take christmas but that's not really what you wanted me to talk about is it no yeah, good start so, though so the um as far as as far as my week goes it feels like more and more time is being devoted to broadband um the digital divide which is the skag sanday group um is is um, trying to get its um, uh, county um, lobbyists all on the same on the same page, and and speak and speak to the federal um, contacts with a single voice. Um, and one of their main points is they want to um, have whatever money we're able to obtain from the from the feds, which we've asked that group's asked for four point eight billion. Um, they want it to be delivered to SCAG, and then SCAG would, would oversee the allocation of that money to the counties, and then the counties would oversee that money to the various projects within the various cities. Um, 
I met with uh, the city of Ventura this week. I also met with the city of Ojai this week. And, and I've also met with Santa Paula. We've met with Fillmore. Um, and uh, um, we've tried to, we've tried to, well, actually, I think we met with everybody at some point, but those are the two from this week. And the, the main question is, so how is this going to work? How is this, how is this money going to be um, managed, supervised, handed out? And I think that uh, my view is we're going to, my, I'm, no decision's been made. Um, first, SCAG needs to get the money. Then SCAG uh, needs to work with counties to figure out how we will do some allocation of that. And once we have a handle on that, then we need to figure out what will happen within our county. But the, the basic premise is that each, that the county is going to take lead on getting the, the middle mile um, pieces in place per the um, diagram that Bill showed earlier. That connects to all of the cities. Every city gets a gets hooked into that. Yes, that right there. And then um, from there, we our next step would be to identify the disadvantaged areas, disadvantaged, underserved. To me, they're different, but and in terms of people talking about it, it sort of seems like it's the same thing. These are people that can't afford or don't have internet, and the money that's coming out of the federal government for infrastructure, the money attached to the Newsom Open Access Middle Mile Final Mile project are both prioritizing underserved disadvantaged. Um, so we will need to, uh, this, the county has a few of those uh, areas that we'll focus on, but then, but we'll also be working with the cities on theirs. And so for example, within the city of Ojai, um, there are some areas that need to be to fit that category. So we are expecting the city to, and the cities to identify those areas. Um, we can assist in working with ISPs or other telecom construction companies to build out those areas um, and, uh, and then provide the funding out of this money that's allocated to the county for those. Once we are starting to make progress on those areas, then we'll start looking at other areas that, are, um, that need a um, fiber connection. One of, the, um, one of the things that came out of the conversation with the uh, um, uh, okay, so that's that's the, the federal side. On the state side, the CPUC has been holding meetings. The Southern California Association of Governments has um, an attorney that has submitted comments on, on the behalf of all of the counties. Um, there are some that are provided that I know Brian has submitted uh, uh, comments directly on the city of Moore Park uh, to, this, to this process. Um, there was a meeting yesterday that included um, a... Uh, uh, comments, basically a, a real-time comments uh, input, which I thought was interesting uh, because up to so far, the comments either were submitted through the website or they were submitted through someone that had standing, which is what SCAG has, for more formal comments. Um, and what, what kind of surprised me was the, um, there was seven to 10 people on that call from the Oakland area. Every single one of them raised their hands and every single one of them talked about um, uh, the 880 freeway versus the 580 freeway and how the 880 went through a disadvantaged area. It always, it's never, it's, it's never been given what it needs. There's a big equity issue here. And, and by the time everybody was done talking with all of the statistics they threw out, I thought, yeah, I would vote for, for going down the 582. There was someone from um, uh, um, the coastal side up by San Francisco, and then there was somebody from the Central Valley. There wasn't really, other than Bill, I didn't see anybody else on that call uh, from Southern California. And, and I was I was scanning back and forth across six or seven pages looking for names, but and people were coming and going. So there might have been, but I just didn't see them. Oakland sure got ganged up on. I mean, that was amazing the amount of. Uh... I don't, I, I, it was positive and negative. You know, it was, it was pretty, pretty rough meeting at, at moments about hitting those underserved areas. Yeah, well, I would, I would say the, the area of Oakland got a lot of attention. And I would say that the Oakland communities and, and other entities that were on that call were sort of ganging up on the CPUC and saying, look, you know, we all agree that this, you didn't do it right. The way that you've laid this out is wrong. You need to fix it. And um, I mean, one of them even started throwing out a challenge that, you know, there's a, this is a civil rights issue. Yeah. And, you know, if you need the NAACP to call you, uh, you know, and get you squared away on what the issues might be, you probably want to do that now before you go much further. I mean, literally, right? Yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, again, uh, they mentioned that there's 15 priority projects, but they didn't tell us what they were, so we can't report on that. Um, and uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing I still got out of that was um, CPUC is, uh, and Caltrans and everybody doing the building is really focused in our area on the 101. And uh, I think that they didn't do a very good job of explaining how they were going to move this along. Caltrans is taking ownership of the entire project from a construction point of view, uh, but I've said this repeatedly. You know, I've been watching the 101 um, reconstruction from Muscle Shoals North past um, Carpinteria, and I also drove the 101 widening from Thousand Oaks to Oxnard. Those were many year projects, and I can't even fathom how they're going to get the 101 they're going to run middle mile fiber down the 101 in any in any time frame that works for anybody in Southern California. So, um, and they said, you know, we haven't made final decisions. We haven't worked it all out yet. Okay, so um, a lot of unknowns. Six billion dollars has been allocated, which isn't enough for the state of California, and a lot of planning is still going on. Uh, and I would say that covers pretty much what happened this week on my side. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally. It's frustrating because it's just uh, hanging at this point. You know, we, we... Oh, one more thing, Bill. Um, okay. So I, did, I have reviewed, so the county is going to um, contract through Magellan with two grant writing organizations. Um, and uh, we're going to resume going after uh, grants at a sm on a smaller scale. What's being shown here um, represents, I'll, I'll round up $25 million, what's on this slide right here to basically get from Santa Clara, Santa Clarita, Simi Valley, Agura Hills, West, all the way out to the 33 and the 101. And uh, so uh, by looking at um, the various other grants, most of which are, are positioned on that earlier slide that Bill went through, um, we can probably go after smaller allocations of that if we, if someone handed us eight million dollars, we could get from Santa Clarita to Ventura City, along the uh, the Santa Paula Railway, and that would cover a number of disadvantaged neighborhoods and give us a, a northerly, um, you know, direct internet connection we could take advantage of for lots of reasons. Um, and if we got another another five or six, we could get from Simi down to. Um, where the 101 sorry where the 118 terminates uh, Wells Road which would give us a more southerly route and then from there we can lateral down into Camarillo and Oxnard and uh, Thousand Oaks area uh, so we'll continue to pursue those um, as as we wait for the federal and state um, project or legislatures to do their thing that's all I have so Terry I'm going to cue you up to have one more set of comments and, and that would be um, how do you define the term middle mile? And when I say that, you know, and, and I'm thinking towards what you've done, what we want to do up in the other two counties north of here, and that is we design a middle mile to truly interconnect communities, you know, and you come and anchor institutions eventually. And, and when it comes to disaster preparedness, the redundancy aspect of it, we really do want to see this interconnection. The map that we've seen coming from the state so far is nothing close to that. It, it, it leaves some communities off. There are no redundancies in many areas. Uh, and so the idea of middle mile as defined by Sacramento or wherever it's coming from is very, very different. Um, and how, we, how, you know, we're gonna have to figure out how to reconcile it because I think our solution is far better. We can't just, you know, rest in what, what's happening in terms of where, where, the, where the state wants to go. Right. Well, so to, to me, the difference between the state and the county is the state has however many square miles California is to deal with and a lot of rural space. And the county is a much smaller area to focus on. So um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to spread their three and a half billion dollars across a lot of highways to get and I'll say it in terms that I think I've heard somebody say on the project team at the state level, they want to get the most bang for their buck. So they're looking at major, major thoroughfares. They want to do it along their rights of way. So they look at major thoroughfares that um, get to the most communities for um, a reasonable amount of funding. We, and, and they weren't apparently too concerned about redundancy. 
um, because their thought is the the ISPs or whoever picks it up from the middle mile point can worry about redundancy. That's my opinion. In the in our case, we didn't we didn't have any state route or project to lean on when we were first designing this a year and a half ago. Um, so we took it from the point of view we want to provide the best cap capability to our county. So we were looking at multiple points of presence. We've identified three now: Santa Clarita, Simi Valley, Agoura Hills. Uh, we wanted to have uh, make sure our middle mile hit um, and interconnected to existing municipal fiber because that would then extend this network beyond just what we're showing here um, by taking advantage of existing infrastructure. And we want a redundancy. So if any link goes down, there would be a route, another route to the internet and to the rest of the network. And so you see, you see redundant paths here that are, are paths here that provide redundancy only. There, there's, not a, uh, there's not a lot of advantage to the route that's coming down um, the 118 versus the route that's coming down Santa Rosa um, in um, through Cam and through Northern Camarillo, except that it creates redundancy. That's the that's the the, the main thing it does there. It also makes it easier to get to Somas and to Nyland and to El Rio, which are areas that needs need to have this. Um, but we could have done that, and and we will do that differently when we first start constructing, because we would. The 126 is, a, is an important um, starting point for us, but we can come down Wells Road from the 126 and tap into the 118 and then tap into some of those neighborhoods just by going that route, even if that 23 crossover or the entire 118 link isn't done yet. So I'm not sure that completely answered the question, but based it, upon it, you know, my two years yeah. of experience in broadband, that's kind of my view. Well, and I, I know we've tried to push back on the folks up north saying we need a more robust middle mile solution. We've designed right. it, you know, just fund us, you know, and I'm not sure, how, I'm hoping that those conversations take, get some traction. Well, and, and if the digital divide group comes in and their funding is available I and mean, you're going to have the funds required to build this, and there's other grants, of course, that we can use to build this as well. Um, but I, I don't see statewide enough funding for to treat every region with this level of fidelity you know it, it's, well it, well it, let's think about that statement for a second bill there's not enough there so somebody did a pretty thorough analysis on the skag group working with crown castle to serve all the dwellings all 100 percent of the dwellings with 100 megabit um fiber was $8.8 billion. That's seven counties in Southern California, $8.8 .8 billion. Newsom's bill is $6 billion for the state. And only three and a half billion of that is for middle mile. Yes. So the math that happened up north and the math that happened in the south aren't even close. So by if we were to if we were to say Southern California represents, it's more than this, but I'll just make it easy, half the population then the state needs $17 billion um, to close the digital divide and, they, and Newsom gave us six. Yeah. So it's not enough at all. Oh, last thing, it came out in the CPUC meeting. So a lot of people have been talking about hotspots. A lot of people have been talking about 5G. Um, what I heard on that call was that all this money, infrastructure money is tied to pretty much buried or aerial fiber, not wireless. That doesn't mean that Individual areas can't try to use wireless. In fact, Santa Paula, there was somebody from Santa Paula on this call. When I was talking to Santa Paula, they had said that a, um, and I don't know if it was AT&T or Verizon or who it was, is actually installing two towers in Santa Paula right now uh, for 5G. So I think Santa Paula's view is we already have enough buried fiber in or around Santa Paula. We don't need much more, but we're happy to let you take advantage of what we do have, but in terms of getting to the disadvantaged neighborhoods, you know, 5G is going to be here. So my thought was, well, that's really good from, from a consortium point of view, because there actually is a city that's taking the lead, or at least working with a vendor that's taking the lead to develop uh, and install a 5G network in an, in an area that needs it. And, and we should be able to see how that works for us. And the, we, don't, we can't use federal money for 5G or apparently state money for 5G, but we could 
do our own grants and make our own investments in 5G if we thought it was going to work out for us. That's a good data point. That's new news. That's exciting. So we need to look at it as a pilot. So um, I'll be interested a month from now as we re reconnect and, and talk about all of this stuff to really delve deeper into this last mile, middle mile connection, how what Terry's doing in the middle mile can be a catalyst for each of the communities. You know, Brian, I, I'm interested in your thoughts uh, as well as Jamie's and Kevin's and anybody else that wants to share uh, in, in where, 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 in terms of what you see coming and the work that needs to be done in the middle mile, in the last mile space, uh, ideas, any things we can do to catalyze it, move it forward. I do have a question, but I, I know Joe Corella. I wanted to ask a question also in the chat, and then George has his hand up too, so I, I yield to them first. Okay, George, why don't we go first? Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, nice to see you all. And uh, it's something I've been looking forward to all month, so uh, it's good to hear uh, Terry's update. Thank you, Terry. Um, yesterday, I drove to Santa Barbara in the morning during rush hour traffic, and I have to say it was not pleasant. Yeah. Uh, so I would suggest if anybody is going to do that, uh, leave, leave very early. But uh, also, I'll mention that uh, taking the uh, alternate roads, the side roads parallel to the 101 freeway are not going to save you any time. Uh, it traffic's clearing up at Toro Canyon and it's pretty smooth spelling from there. But while I was on the side road yesterday, I observed that, uh, and this is a follow up to what Terry mentioned earlier. Uh, there was deployment of brand new aerial utility poles with fiber optics running through Carpentria, through Summerland, et cetera, uh, adjacent to the 101. Um, it was shocking, actually, to see it. Brand new utility poles, and I could see the fiber cables uh, at the bottom run. So um, I, I, I would suspect at some point they would consider burying that, but I, I just don't know. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you for sharing um, that. We, yeah, we... and then a question, something which is unclear to me and somewhat ambiguous, uh, and it may be somewhat ambiguous still to the overall discussion, but great that the funding may or may not show up, whether it's through SCAG or direct to the county or uh, county distributing it to cities, et cetera. Um, once the fiber is in the ground, uh, is it going to be conduit? Is it going to be dark fiber? Is it going to be lit fiber? And if it's lit fiber, who will be the responsible party for uh, O&M and also optical gear? That's uh, something that is still somewhat ambiguous to me. I think it's going to stay ambiguous. I think the answer to your question is yes. You know, I think that there's going to be some municipal fiber. I think there's going to be some private sector fiber. You know, I think that uh, what's going to be different is the fact that we have probably better visibility in the future than we have today of the assets available. And we'll be able to say, this is who you go talk to, to be able to get access to it. This is who you partner with to be able to get access and, and participation with it. Terry, go ahead. Um, right. Uh, actually, I, I was typing this comment, but I'll take it out. So, George, great observation. Thank you. I didn't notice those utility poles, or maybe they just put them up since I had taken that drive last time. So maybe that's going to be their answer. They'll just run the, the poles aerially down the uh, uh, the 101. But um, so our plan is, um, as Bill said, yes, but let me be more specific. So within in any trench that we um, are a partner to do the RFP for, I believe there will be three kinds of fiber. There will be, uh, I'm gonna call it government fiber, um, meaning that this is fiber that the county um, owns, controls. Um, we're responsible for the care and maintenance, the optical endpoints, all of that. Uh, I believe within, within that same bundle or that same conduit, we would also have, we'll call it dark fiber, which is fiber that we can make available to other entities at county discretion. Uh, so if a city wanted um, some fiber, um, we could uh, uh, provide that to them. And then the last category is we would install empty conduits. And these conduits would be allowed for partner providers to utilize because in talking to some of them, it doesn't, and it doesn't make sense to me that um, uh, 
ISP with lease fiber that we have because now we run into the situation of who actually owns the infrastructure and if and if there's a problem along the route can they turn to the county and say hey your fiber's not working and and i don't think anybody wants that if we provide uh, the conduit and let them pull their own, fi own fiber then basically they own the infrastructure end to end um, and and they can be responsible for it so we'll have we'll have um, installed fiber that we can control some of which we will we will own and some of it we can share with others and then we'll have empty conduits for partners. And what about the optical gear? Um, so the optical gear for the empty conduits is not our responsibility. It'll be whoever we we lease the empty conduit to for the government fiber. Um, so anything going to that fiber that terminates in our facilities, we would handle. Um, anything that terminates at where that fiber terminates at a um, data center, including one Wilshire, um, I'm 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 not sure, but I'm in, I think pushing for us to own it is the right way to go. Um, and then if any of those um, any of that fiber becomes um, uh, used by other uh, government entities besides the county, I think if the fiber is terminating in in um, uh, Oxnard data center then I think Oxnard owns that end um, and and at that point now we, we st we're sharing assets and so we're going to need some sort of an arrangement and that's the part we haven't worked out yet that's where I think Bill is saying we don't know because we haven't architected to that far yet we're just trying to get stuff in the ground thanks for that update Terry oh and one other point uh because Bill mentioned the middle, middle mile I say this a lot in 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 software development too um it, it, trust me, in my mind, it's related. Middle mile by itself does absolutely nothing for nobody. It, you're just, you've laid glass in the ground and it does nothing. It has zero value. The only time that middle mile has one penny of value to anybody is when we connect it to somebody that needs it. So middle mile means nothing without final mile. Yeah. Yeah. But keep in mind, final mile could be the 5G towers. Could be. That yeah. price value. Absolutely. And that would be the, you know, the last mile connectivity for some users. That's absolutely correct. And that's what Nyland's doing. Nylon is basically um, uh, siphoning off bandwidth from the school district, Oxnard School District, uh, running it, microwaving it over to their, um, their neighborhood, and then distributing it across basically high powered WAPs. And that's where they just can't get enough bandwidth, but conceptually it's, it's working for them. Yeah. Mr. Corella, you have a question? Yeah, Mr. Simmons, first, a uh, very interesting conversation uh, to, to Terry's point and, and George's comment. I would suggest that there are all sorts of final mile wireless delivery mechanisms. Could be fixed wireless, could be WAPs, could be 5G. Uh, nothing that I see on this plan limits those options, number one. Uh, number two, I wanted to circle back to uh, the comment that SCAG has standing. It's still very unclear to me how California will be allocating these funds. We Let's agree, absolutely, we'll stipulate to woefully underfunded. Um, is that $8 million a real number? Uh, it's not even clear how you apply for those funds to me. Um, maybe, Terry, you have, have better insight, but it still seems embryonic if not just conceptual at this point. Thoughts? Sure, when you, sure, thanks. So um, when we talk about the, um, the 8 billion for SCAG, so when we talk about SCAG having standing, SCAG has standing with a, with a CPUC project um, at the state level, um, which has been funded to 6 billion, um, three and a half for middle mile, um, nothing much beyond that. There is no planning and, and no one has, what I think is going on here is they plan to take the, the three and a half million and they're just going to turn it over to Caltrans and say, go, go build. The, the final mile they haven't figured out yet. Um, the fact that the SCAG has standing simply means they can influence the process more formally than if you just submitted public comments via that's, their website. That's, that's the way I read it. And right. so the, then the derivative question becomes, Dear Caltrans, here's three and a half billion dollars. Do your best. What kind of influence can we collectively have with Caltrans? Well, um, if you, if I go back to the meeting from yesterday or was it Tuesday with um, uh, where there were you know a couple hundred people on the call, I think Oakland made a pretty the Oakland entities because only 
each entity could have one speaker, but they managed to coordinate a number of speakers. And I think they made a pretty compelling case. If I read the nods and, and some other um, body signals from the, the project people, I think they took those Oakland comments pretty seriously. So I think, I think we can influence that. Matter of fact, the, one of the, the lead um, project people said, you know, we're listening to you, you know, we're definitely gonna go back and take a look at this. I, I don't know if that means they're actually gonna do it, but they use those words, their body language seemed to indicate um, that they would. But I also wanna go back to the 8 billion. So the 8 billion has nothing to do with the, at right now it has nothing to do with the state. Um, right. And actually, let me clarify, it's the 4.8 for the federal government. And then they were gonna try and match that with state money. So uh, there, is no, there is no process for that. Basically what happened is the SCAG and the seven counties wrote a letter, a, a comprehensive letter with everybody's signature from the seven counties, basically to Pelosi and um, uh, some other key people in the House and, and in the Senate, to uh, our representatives as well, to um, lobby for um, once that $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill gets signed, they're saying, um, we want you to kind of preemptively assign $4.8 billion to um, the seven Southern California counties, deliver the money to SCAG, and, and we'll take care of closing the digital divide in a pretty big section of the country. And, and that, but that's all, that's all prospective. I mean, I'm looking at the monies that they have currently allocated which right. is still ambiguous to me, and I'm working that process myself as right. well. It, it's, it's still pretty ambiguous. Just on the funds committed, I'm interested in the funding source behind this, because if it's ARP money, there's specific stipulations in using that money, or is the state fully funding that whole uh, the, the funding source? Right? You, you mean for the, for the money that Skag's working on with the feds? Yes. Yeah, so the so the money the money's already the money that we're going after is part of the 1.5 trillion dollar infrastructure bill already approved by the Senate and now being I'll say held hostage in the house while they work on their other you know um, build back America bill the the three and a half that's now one and a half or whatever that number is uh, so there so that was increased by a half a, a half a trillion dollars this year specifically for certain purposes, roads, water, and one of them was um, broadband. Uh, a significant amount of money was put in there for broadband, some 500, uh, I, that's the wrong number, but some, some hundreds of billions of dollars was put in for broadband. And so we're basically, what, what Skag said is we want, we want a portion of that. So no, I, think, I, th I think in that infrastructure bill, I think the specific number is 65 billion allocated to broadband of which okay. $40 billion will be allocated through states. And I guess that's where it gets confusing to right. me. There's $40 billion that will be allocated among states. Let's assume California is a relative winner because of size, right. population, political influence. Right. The question is, the, the stipulations that are tied to that funding, those pass through, I'm guessing. And again, this is all future, assuming this passes. I'm interested right. in the current funding that's there and some stipulations and i'm doing some research bill maybe we can at some future call uh when i get some more, more clarification share what i've learned yeah but i'm here it's all pretty vague to me not that i'm a buyer necessarily and, and joe my, with the caveat that my understanding is also hazy on this my understanding is that the, that california took a good chunk of that federal money if not all of it co-mingled it with a bunch of its own, you know, part of the six billion in the state funds and created the coronavirus capital projects fund, which itself has several sub programs in it. And that's what they're doing with most, if not all of that money. And that co-mingling, Brian, I agree that that co-mingling jeopardizes some of the attributes, some of the benefits of ARP funding. ARP funding, for example, if you use it for an approved infrastructure intention, Broadband is one of the three. Exclusively, you're exempt from federal NEPA. If you commingle even one dollar of non-ARPA funds, NEPA is reintroduced. Yeah, and I'm not sure about the state's use of ARPA fund, but on the local government level, because cities and counties 
also receive ARPA money, right? Which, uh, you know, Bill talked about in Santa Barbara County. Yep. Um, you know, yep. in addition to infrastructure, I know because I'm having internal fights, you know, here in City Hall to use that money for broadband, but I'm up against a lot of other things that are on the social service and direct pandemic response money, childcare interests. Um, you know, it, it's a tough policy call for our elected officials to distribute that money. Um, I'm sure that's true of every city and every county. Yep. But I, my point being, there's a difference between the ARPA money going to California and the ARPA money going to locals. I can't emphasize how important this conversation is. I mean, in the next six months, we every municipality, every region has, has we've got to get answers and be ready. You know, and it, it's not so much shovel ready. Yes, it is, but it's, how is this money going to fall, and how are we going to make sure that it's coordinated when it does? And every community is going to have their heat map, and they'll know what the areas where the greatest need are, and where to apply the funds, and what applications to fill out, and how to bring it home. I mean, that is that's the mission here: is to make sure that when these questions are answered. All the answers are, are are not only spread out and shared, but also prepared, and we're ready for it. You know, and I think if we can get there sooner than other regions, we're going to be that much ahead of the game. So that, that really is the end game here at this moment. So this is a great conversation. I wanted to to ask a, a question, and and it's kind of putting Steve Sawyer and Monica Gibbs on the spot, but. You know, in Moore Park, I, I wield a meet me room hammer, so I'm looking for nails to hit, right? Um, so one of the questions that, that George also brought up is, or sorry, Terry mentioned, you know, is getting from middle mile to last mile. And, you know, the, the physical thing that is that to us is that meet me room. So, you know, for the two, I assume, significant incumbent providers in our region, you know, if we make these available throughout the, the county, will that actually increase the speed with which AT&T and Charter would deploy networks in these unserved or underserved um, communities? Or is it more likely going to be the you know, small to medium ISPs, the regional ISPs who would be doing that? Yeah, Brian, this is Steve. Um, it's hard to answer that question just because uh, until the county releases their RFP, uh, we're not quite sure how our current network matches up to the overall needs of the county. Um, I mean, as you well know, you know, we're pretty well deployed throughout the entire county. Um, and we are trying to identify those unserved areas and working with the consortium in, in various cities for, you know, CASIV grants to build out. Yeah. But um, again, you know, it, it's difficult to answer that question. Yeah, this was Monica. Um, I agree. That's why it took me a minute. I was just like, it just, I feel like, you know, getting, getting the RFIs, RFPs, I think um, another thing that is interesting is just now that this information is rolling and the money is rolling, I feel like a lot of ISPs are going to be more likely to provide the information um, and to have a seat at the table. Um, I feel like, you know, when Ventura sent, sent it out, it was very quick turnaround and it was um, something that was just so at the beginning stages. And I feel like right now there's a lot of opportunity to really pull in ISPs, get as much information as possible. And then, you know, once we get the RFPs, we're able to uh, figure out the lay of the land, so. One of, the, yeah, one of the interesting pieces to this is, and, and Paul Chine is with us from Cuyama, is, uh, I'm not convinced that Cuyama makes sense for any ISP to necessarily build the 60 some odd miles that's going to require it up the mountain for fiber to deliver to that that town. You know, and, and so whatever solution, you know, there is a there is this urban solution, but then there's also the rural solution. And, and you know, as part of this conversation, we're going to have to have government-owned public sector fiber that goes up that mountain into that community and, and have the partnerships with the ISPs to serve those communities. 
And, and that's going to have to be an investment made in, in some collaborations established and relationships to be able to provide service there. And so I, I can't emphasize enough that model and how we do that, whether it's going to be, you know, 60 some odd miles into a rural community or maybe just 10 miles, you know, in, into some community. It, that model is going to have to be established and those relationships develop where they haven't been perhaps over time in recent years. So it, 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 we're, we're going to have to create this. It's going to be a new direction for us, I believe. Paul, I know you've got it. You've had answers in the chat, and uh, you know I, I want to make sure that you're aware that Cuyama will be on the map from Ventura County, from Santa Barbara County, from San Luis Obispo County. You're kind of the the, the pinnacle of all three counties up there. Right, and and I I agree with that. My other you know comment in the section is you know I. I see this map for Ventura County and it totally leaves out all the population that lives in the Northeast. And, and so I, I, I'm not saying that they should include that in this go around, but it should at least be on their map. Yeah. Uh, and it isn't. Yeah. And, uh, when you talk about an underserved and unserved area, that definitely would be there. And so I, I think that they would at least address it in concept. And, and so, um, as as my conversation with Salute Carvajal was out here the other day, my conversation with him is you can put all the money on the table you want, but if you can't get anybody to build it out, it doesn't make a difference. And and that's where we are now. Uh, there's a lot going to be lots of money on the table, but somebody actually has to want to do it. Or I think that the the um, the federal or state government should actually run the fiber and own it. Yeah. I do believe, uh, Terry, you probably looked at the map closer uh, coming down uh, Caltrans in the five. Um, but Fraser Park, for example, you know, when you get up into that part of, of our, our county, um, we, we, it, it, that is not part of our middle mound network, but it could be, should be, we, we can't just design our regional solution leaving them off. Uh, yeah. Well, that was another one I was just typing to. So the middle mile represents what we consider to be the information superhighway, right? So um, kind of like when we we don't have a four lane freeway going to Lockwood, we have a two lane highway going to Lockwood, at least from the Ventura County side. And so what we and this is the and this also applies to uh, Muscle Shoals, Santa Clarita, um, entities um, northwest of Ventura up the 101. The um, so the our view is that those are laterals that we need to provide or, or extensions to specific communities that we need to provide. Uh, so yes, we would make sure that Lockwood would be covered, just like um, the Ventura County entities north of Ventura would be covered. Um, that being said, with the CPUC, it did, it has occurred to me that um, because they're coming down the five, we could and it's open access, we could tap into that. Um, to serve some of the other parts um, from their middle mile versus our middle mile. Yeah. And I don't know what happened. Bill, this is Julie, really by the way. Sorry, Terry. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, yeah, to just follow up on Brian's question. I mean, one thing that I keep asking on this call was individual meetings, cities, and I've you know, met with Amy and Brian and Kevin and, you know, to identify where these unserved or underserved areas are. For example, I know Nyland Acres is a big uh, priority for the county. And when I checked with our engineers and our construction folks, I mean, we serve that area. So trying to get clarification or the definition of what is deemed unserved or underserved, you know, do they have internet? It's just poor quality. Uh, and we're not the provider. Uh, so again, just trying to get locations, uh, addresses, neighborhoods, so that we can research and find out exactly what, you know, where our network is in relationship to those areas. Uh, so again, I just ask you know, everybody on the call if you could provide me with those addresses and, and neighborhoods so I can at least verify, you know, where Spectrum is in relationship to those neighborhoods. And I think I can answer that on the Moore Park side. It's exactly three business parks that we're, we're working with Spectrum and others to get those lit up. Um, but we do have 
pick your number percent coverage in our residential areas here in Moore Park. So basically everybody in Moore Park that needs fiber can get fiber and, and, and 100 megabits. To be correct, the, the remaining neighborhoods basically are literally the house on the hill who are very capable of affording through the air services. Right, like SOMAS is. Uh, so um, back to uh, Stephen's question or point about Nylon. So um, there's already service in Nylon. So anybody in Nylon that could afford it could simply sign up for internet now at whatever the going rate is and they could get it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So no, no build out required, just plug in and go. Um, and so the, I think then the point for Nyland is uh, those are some deep lots with a lot of families living in one address one one uh, APN I guess I'll call it um, a lot and so um, you know they're gonna they want to pay ten dollars a month for internet if they can even afford that can they get that well not currently with our I mean our low cost broadband spectrum internet assist is eighteen dollars a month and they can apply for the emergency broadband benefit uh, program which is a voucher for $50 a month towards their bill and $100 for a tablet or computer. So there are programs out there, but you know, uh, unless I have an individual address to find out, is it customer equipment? Is it you know, frayed wire or you know, whatever the reason might be for that particular resident, because there could be a whole myriad of reasons for, you know, for internet service. So again, I just asked for, you know, Specific, so we can find out if it's, you know, uh, on the node. Is it in the house? You know, what the issue is. But we are servicing Nylon Acres. Well, that's a great example. So I think what we can do is we're hooked up to the um, uh, the grassroots organization that created this um, wireless, I'll say, um, solution that they implemented. Um, I'll just I'll just get a hold of them and ask them point blank. So apparently, according to my sources, you have internet and you can get it at eighteen dollars a month with assistance program. So why are you going through all of this trouble um, and complaining about not having enough bandwidth? And 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 probably also you're taking bandwidth from the school district. So when they're in session, that might not be a good thing. So I think we can go back and ask them, and we'll right. let you know. And I continue to That'd believe. Be great, Terry, that. Thank you. I believe that the limiting factor continues to be, and I'm not saying this is correct, but I'll, I'll go out and say it's wrong, but is an issue of trust that government generally and big telecoms, including AT&T, Charter, and others, a lot of these prospective users do not want to give information to these big entities um, for fear of reprisal or that their information will be sold or leaked out and people just don't want to to do it and it's a trust issue which is very difficult to get in but I, i'd be interested to hear what the nonprofit is saying because one of those things of oh, well, those wireless networks is you just have a device and that's it and even though it's not any more private it does feel more private because you're not getting a bill with your name on it to your home all the time um, but i suspect that would be the case and yet, and yet, these are the same people that are probably paying water bills and gas bills and electric bills and cell phone uh, bills. Yeah. yeah, good point. Good point, Brian. But I, I'm going to call them. I'll ask them point blank. You know, so my understanding is you have service. Why aren't you using it? Yeah. Because um, you're not getting enough. The, the and by the way, that what they've got there only is is designed right now for the grade schoolers. Um, and they originally and they eventually wanted to expand it to include uh, high schoolers and then everybody but they couldn't because of their broadband, because of their bandwidth or limitations. So I'll find out, I'll report back. You know, one of the, yeah, I, I know in talking to Cox uh, up in Santa Barbara area, one of the things that they were able to do is work closely with the schools. And as much as the schools would point at particular addresses and certain students in certain classes is, and in, in terms of the broadband funding through COVID that was coming, the schools would end up paying the bill if Cox would connect them. And, and, and so instead of having the, the, the Cox relationship with the, the, the address and the, whoever lives there, it was with the school itself. And, and so the school was the one that bridged that trust gap. You know, it, it, and, and basically, that, I thought that was a very innovative approach. The, you know, the business model 
shifted in, in, instead of uh, billing the resident who, who has a particular address, they were billing the school and, and the school was paying the bill. You know, and, and so I think those kinds of innovative approaches are kind of going to be, have, are, are going to mature. They're going to be, you know, evolve into this new normal. And when you get into these neighborhoods where cost is going to be an issue, but we need to be able to make sure that we're going to have the potential for a, a virtual classroom, maybe the schools as a partner is going to be a, a key player in this conversation to make this happen. You know, I, I, I think that uh, Steve's point is right on. You know, there, I, I think that when we talk about digital inclusion in, in a lot of these areas, the service exists, the relationship doesn't. And, and that's the problem. It, it, it's a people problem, not an infrastructure problem. And, and so we're gonna have to figure out where these areas are and then go in there and, and provide some community interventions of sort with stakeholders, schools, not-for-profits, whatever solutions are gonna make sense and, and try to resolve it that way. More of a- is there, is there any continued interest at the County Office of Education to rejoin these calls or is there some progressive school district out there who would like to be part of the group just as a, you know, a key stakeholder? I think so. Um, I, you know, I, I, I have good conversations with them. I think they're busy, you know, but uh, you know, I, I think that we, it wouldn't be hard to, you know, when the time comes, when the time is right to bring them right in and make them, you know, very part of, of something very specific. We're still talking, these conversations are still at a high level, but when you get into certain neighborhoods where you're going to want to do certain execution and actions, yeah, I think they'll be right there with us. Hey, Bill, can I ask a question um, just uh, for Steve? Um, when I was reading the detail of SB 156, uh, it looks like, I mean, there's money for incumbents like you guys um, to build out infrastructure to areas that are not meeting the 100 megabits definition now. You know, we've shared some areas, you know, in Oxnard that that uh, where we don't have that service from from uh, from the spectrum. Are you guys looking at uh, leveraging that funding as well? Absolutely, absolutely. We're looking at any opportunity we can partner with municipalities for any of the grant programs coming from the feds or the state level. You know, I go back to CASA from the California Advanced Services Fund in trying to uh, build out to you know, unserved areas that don't have any broadband capability and those that you know are lower than the, the standard for the definition of broadband. So we're always looking for opportunities and willing to talk to anybody about that. Kevin, is there particular areas? Uh, and we, you, you and I have talked a bit about South Oxnard, um, but you know, do we? Are there some areas that we could target in more specifically that you're aware of that uh, we could maybe write a grant up to Sacramento for? Yeah, well, we do know, um, and Steve and I have talked about this. Uh, the Del Norte Boulevard area. Um, there's definitely a, an issue where, where we can't get, uh, th there's lack, there's infrastructure that's not there with the incumbents. And so we've had several businesses reach out to us and, and ask for help uh, in that area. So I know Steve, we're, I appreciate you working with us on that and trying to find some solutions, but that, that's an area where we have some exposure in the business community, but that's the business community. That's, that's a, it's a business area. Um, so that's a little, you know, a little different in, in that sector. Yep. Yeah, Story of my life. Yep. Thank you. Um, I guess when, when I'm talking about bringing the digital divide and thinking of residential or unserved areas for residential, and I understand that small and medium sized businesses are also caught up in the digital divide and trying to build out those areas as well. Um, it's a little different circumstance than the residential uh, issue, but uh, yeah, we'll continue to you know, look for opportunities in, in the, the business community. So I'm wanting to wrap this up with a bow. Uh, is there any other comments that we need to be discussing um, yeah, in terms of the round table here and, and uh, topics we haven't talked about that we need to bring up before we adjourn? I'd like to bring one up if I may, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have uh, talked over the past year or so about the Ray Baum Act and 
there are some sections within the Ray Baum Act, which today will affect each and every uh, business and each and every uh, municipality or government agency. And that has to do with uh, a deadline coming for compliance on January 6th. It has to do with Section 506 in the Ray Baum Act. Um, and this kind of also overlays into broadband in some ways. And this exists a lot because of the conversations and the networks of broadband, over the top services, uh, remote workers, soft phones, et cetera. Um, it, there's an obligation now with a deadline that you have to provide a dispatchable location for a employee uh, to be able to dial 911, whether they're in your office or if they're working from home. Uh, in addition, if they're using uh, uh, their mobile phone, if they're using their own personal mobile phone for business, if they're using uh, an assigned mobile phone for business, the, the dispatchable location has to be provided to the PSAP. And in addition, an alert needs to come to an administrator to work with um, police, fire, et cetera. It, it's pretty complex. It's uh, for MLTS services, enhanced location and off-premise. Uh, I just bring this up as there's a deadline looming and I think it's uh, greatly overlooked. So uh, if anybody needs any more information about that, I'm happy to assist. George, if you want to uh, put a paragraph together or a link or something and, and put it in our weekly updates, I don't mind passing it around to everybody on our list just to be create an awareness for it. Okay, sounds great. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an essential service and uh, it does exist because of the over the top features of what we're discussing here with broadband. Yeah. And uh, now it's it's in the regulation yeah. uh, and there are deadlines uh, facing us. The deadlines would be good to let people be aware of. Will do. Anything else? It's great to see you guys. I appreciate it. and gals, Monica, I'm sorry about that. I really uh, do appreciate you being here and we'll look forward to reaching out to you between now and our next meeting and updating you further uh, where we're going as the next meeting. We're moving fast, the plane's flying. We'll just keep it in the air. So, <laughs> all right, I'll let you guys go for now. Thank you again. Thanks, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Well. Thank you, Bill. All right, bye.